Hello, my name is Lisa Shea, and I'm the president of the Blackstone Valley Art Association. We have a collaboration with the Milford TV station where we hold shows every two months in their studios. Our plan for the May-June 2020 season was to have a show on the theme of monochrome. Because of the pandemic, we could not hold it in person, so instead we have put together a virtual presentation for you. We have 19 artists and 71 works of art all gathered together on this theme. Each artist will talk about their works and present their art to you. Visit bvaa.org for more information about any of these artists. We hope you enjoy the show. Hello everyone, this is Bob Evans. I'd like to say a few words about the five submissions I have for the Milford TV monochrome show. The first image is called Walking the Dog. This was shot at Shaw's Farm and uh, I introduced the uh, the figures there. Uh, I should say I, I shot this with the figures I deliberately in mind you to show the scale of the place and it's a um, shot from the far end of uh, Shaw's Farm and I particularly like the uh, lines of the clouds and of course I darken the sky as it's a, uh, a monochrome image. I reduce the blue to give this more contrast and of course the figures and the dog uh, give it some scale. Uh, it was shot using a wide angle lens. The second image um, was shot about 30 years ago in Liverpool, UK and this was a film uh, that I developed is actually shot on the film HB5 uh, by Ilford as I say in 1991 and it's of a small street or a, a back alley called uh, Sweeting Street and I like the leading lines and also the the filmy look to it in, a, in other words it's not a really stark um, high contrast high detail digital image it shows a time and a place at least I feel that it um, it depicts it in a good way, at least how I remember it to be, including the garbage and the gutter. The next image is shot uh, using infrared uh, photography of Riverdale Pond, which is uh, just a short walk from where I live. Here I wanted to show the clouds and the reflections in the lake and, and the trees. I just like the way that it c conveys an image of sort of slightly unreal um, the next one is a shot of Linwood Mill and the train tracks. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Linwood Mill's towards the south end of Northbridge, and it was built in the 1800s, and um, it was water-powered initially, and then it was steam-powered. Actually, the, uh, the water inlet, or the head race, is just to the right side of this image. And the train tracks uh, are still there, but of course there's no trains on them anymore. But they used to uh, run up Linwood Avenue and Main Street in, um, in Northbridge, or Whitensville, from the Providence and Worcester main line to uh, service the Whiting Mills there. But uh, it was a long time ago that they were, they were covered up. It's uh, just a small portion of them are exposed. Again, what I wanted to show here was the link between transportation and the old worldly side of things and uh, the mill. I also like the sky and the clouds in this. The final image is of uh, an old mill again in uh, Boroughville, Rhode Island. Here uh, it was a very long uh, area and again I used a wide angle lens to show the, um, the extent of the mill. And I think the black and white treatment works well at this. It looks it looks far better in black and white than it does in colour. Again, it it depicts the decay and the devilic nature of this and the sadness of uh, an old factory that's not been used for many years. I believe this was, uh, I don't know, many years uh, since it's been used. Anyway, I hope you enjoy them. Thanks. Hello, my name is Lisa Shea. 
I'll be doing the narration for Bob C., who's one of the members of our Blackstone Valley Art Association. He also happens to be my boyfriend, and we've been together since 1995, so all of these pictures were taken while we were together. So I'll be inventing stories to go with them, with his permission, to describe the type of photos that he takes. This first one here was taken at the Missouri Botanical Garden and the Japanese Garden section of it, probably back in 1996. We were using film cameras at the time, and the original film picture of this is in color with a lots of greens and blues, but for the purpose of this show, we brought it into Photoshop, we turned it into black and white, and then we cranked up the contrast, and that's in part because James Hunt, who's one of our BVAA members, did a great workshop where he showed us some beautiful images that he had taken of weeds and other sticks and things in ponds, where he turned them black and white and cranked up the contrast. I like that effect immensely, so we did that here, and I think that it brings out the shapes of the petals much more and makes it more about the interplay of light and dark and the ripples in the reflection of the water. This next picture here was also taken with film, and it showcases one of Bob's loves for many years, and this was going to air shows. In this particular picture, it's the F-16s of the Thunderbirds, which is the United States Air Force air show wing, which would do acrobatics and formation flying. He and I used to go to air shows all the time, and we'd camp out nearby so that we could enjoy camping and then the air show. A key part of the challenge of taking photos of air shows was to try to get the camera in the exact right spot as these things flew by at top speed. It's a lot easier now with digital, where you can just snap millions of pictures and have them all take. But when you were working with film, and you just had one picture and had to get that picture just right, uh, it was a challenge, but it was a fun challenge. So in this one, the formation came out just right against the sky. And again, this was taken originally in color, but I really like the black and white version of it, where you just get the shape of the smoke and the shape of the planes in motion. This next picture is probably one of the last pictures taken with the old film camera before we switched over to digital. And this was taken down at the Everglades National Park in Florida. We used to go down there every year and do trips to explore the birding and the uh, wildlife that was there. The trails had alligators which would just lay right on the trail, right on the grass next to the trail or even right across the trail. So they were very, very up close and personal. So this wasn't taken with a zoom lens. This was taken uh, fairly close to them and they were calm and pretty tame. You wouldn't want to sit on them or anything, but they certainly didn't mind if you went walking right past them. I love the detail that you get in this with the texture of the skin and the texture of the grass and the gleam in his eye. But they were pretty content, happy alligators, had a quiet, contented life. The Old Stone Church in West Boylston, Massachusetts is a very photogenic church. It's located right on the reservoir. It was built in 1891, and interestingly, pretty much shortly thereafter, first it was burned again, so they had to repair it and fix it, and then only a year or two after that, they decided to turn this water into a reservoir, so they didn't want people near it anymore. So the church has not been a used church in all that time. Now it stands there as a historic building, and it's beautiful in pictures for people to appreciate, but it's not being used as a, a worship church anymore. Uh, we've taken many pictures of this church in color, so it's mostly greens and blues and then the gray of the church against it. But I like this version where it's black and white, so you focus in on the flag that they have hanging on the far wall, on the crenellations of the tower, on the shapes of the triangles and the squares that are involved in here against the soft, um, more abstract shapes of the trees and the water. This last image is a digital film image, and this was taken fairly recently. This is of a B-17 Boeing Flying Fortress. This is a vintage plane from World War II, and it was kept alive by the Collings Foundation here in Massachusetts. And they would take this plane and other related planes around to air shows, and they would actually fly them, and people could fly inside them and see what it was like to fly these old machines. And you could see that there's the ammunition there and the controls to do the firing. It was a wonderful uh, piece of history to be able to walk around inside and to explore. Sadly, in 2019, when they were flying this in one of their air shows in Hartford, the plane ended up crashing and killing some of the people on board. So we were able to get one of the last photos of it before it met its untimely end.
Hello, this is Brandy Van Roo, and I've submitted this monochrome watercolor entitled Girls at Fountain 2, Sepia, Chinchon, Spain. I took the original photograph back in 1998. Chinchon's a small town south of Madrid, which I was visiting for a work conference. I enjoyed the charm of the girls' matching dresses and the stonework all around them, and the photo has sat in a little frame in my home for 20 years. I just recently completed the small 6x5 inch sapia version, as well as a slightly larger 9x12 inch full color version. And for me, this is a wonderful way to breathe new life into images that I already love. So thank you for letting me share it with you. Good day, and thank you for viewing my contribution to the BVAA Monochrome Photography Show. As you're probably aware of by now, this show was originally planned to be a brick-and-mortar show at the Milford Community TV station. So for that, I'd like to first express my appreciation for the long-term support that they've provided to the BVAA. Liz Harkins and her team have a wonderful community resource and are always looking for new members with the opportunity to create and publish your content. Check them out. That said, I'm Brent DeWitt, a Milford resident, longtime Dilbert level engineer, and amateur photography enthusiast. I most love travel and street photography and find faces the most intriguing part of people. I'm also a great believer of the idea that the best people photos can be made when you engage the subject and become part of their space. A clandestine photo from 15 feet away just isn't the same. As a technical note, none of these images were taken as monochrome, but they were close enough to monochrome that they seemed to be natural for the conversion. The first two images I'm presenting were taken with the same hour on the streets of Florence, Italy. Street performers are a great opportunity for folks like me who don't want to deal with model releases. The first is a fellow that is best described as a living statue. He moves about every five minutes. Engaging isn't quite right with the lack of movement, but a monetary tip in his bucket evoked a friendly attention to my camera. The same attention was wonderfully experienced from the more traditional mime in the second photo. She was incredibly expressive and animated, and this photo represents possibly the only quiet, dramatic image I took of her. Again, I bribed my way in to getting up close and personable, but this couldn't have been taken without it. Moving on, the next photos are portraits of faces that aren't actually people. The annual, most years, not this one, Revere Beach Sand Sculpture Festival is something I encourage everyone to attend at least once in their life. The artistry is hard to imagine if you haven't seen it firsthand. And the subject is contemplative sand. Old. This particular fellow was reported to be about 900 years old at a temple in northern Thailand near Chiang Mai. I wish age and weather could treat me so well. Again, the weathering, the texture, just all create something that's timeless. And last, this young fellow was part of a very large brasswork at Esther Short Park in Vancouver, Washington. I found the expression in the eyes captivating. I regret not noting the sculptor's name, but the park contains a number of just wonderful pieces that is also a park for recreation, and the kids wandering around keep getting in your way. <laughs> so thank you for spending your time to view my work, although I probably shouldn't call it work. I love doing this. Have a good evening and endure.
Hi, this is Carol Frieswick, a longtime member and treasurer of the Blackstone Valley Art Association. Lisa has chosen three of my um, paintings, two of which are pastels and an oil for this monochrome show. The first one is entitled uh, French Antique Bottles. The photo reference came from a friend from the Franklin Art Association. She is a photographer that travels extensively, and these were taken in France. They are antique wine bottles. I thought the monochrome uh, palette would be uh, quite challenging to paint to try to get the shapes of all these bottles, and all the highlights were quite fun to paint. The next one is entitled uh, Apples in Glass Jars. This photo reference was taken at the Tower Hill Botanical Gardens when they were still celebrating the flora in winter with the Worcester Art Museum. These were uh, green apples. They were all encased in glass vases with clear marbles, and it was quite the uh, eye-catching display. And the other one um, is an oil painting. The photo reference from that came from Stonington, Maine. It was at sunset, and um, a sunset cruise was just coming in, and I had taken that picture. Hope you enjoyed them. A fourth oil painting, which was uh, Trees in Menemsha. Menemsha is one of our favorite spots to go to at Martha's Vineyard. And every time I go, I just gaze at this tree um, and keep wanting to paint it. But I've always felt it would be too difficult to paint. So I decided, well, it's time to take the bull by the horn and to paint it. Uh, the photo I had had some nice sunlight on it, and um, I tried to capture that. So that is um, the trees next to the stone wall in Menemsha on Martha's Vineyard. Hi, I'm Dennis Smith. I'm a long-term photographer and a relatively recent watercolorist. I hope you enjoy the three pictures that I have selected for this black and white show. Late one morning, a very coarse mist moved in over the beach. In 25 minutes, I had more fun taking pictures than probably in any other location in my life. This is one of about 10 great pictures that I made that morning of the grounded birds. There are many beautiful trees in Florida that are covered with vines and various plants. This is just one that I selected because of its great affinity for making a black and white picture from it. This picture was taken at Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge in Maryland. I love how all of the browns emerge from the foggy morning. When I was a kid growing up in Virginia, I lived not far from Colonial Williamsburg. And uh, this was before the, the, the uh, Williamsburg became such a theme park. And uh, you could literally drive there, park your car, wasn't that hard to do, and walk into the 1770s. It was an amazing experience, and I, I think it shaped my interest in the architecture of history, which is an interest that um, still consumes me to this very day. So when I moved to the Blackstone Valley uh, five or six years ago, I was immediately struck, of course, by the mills. These, uh, in many instances, enormous structures that sort of rise out of the countryside and almost serve as monuments to everything that occurred here. An amazing boom and an amazing bust. And these, of course, were the textile mills of the Blackstone Valley uh, that were built here to take advantage of the of the Blackstone River itself and the power generated by the fall of the river from Worcester on its way, on its 50-mile journey to Providence. It falls about 500 feet. 
and uh, and it was uh, water power was what made uh, industry possible at the time. It was the only source of viable source of of energy, and so it created an enormous boom all along the river. Um, and at, at one point, there was a mill and a dam nearly every mile, all the way from uh, from Providence uh, to Worcester. And they processed literally millions of tons of textiles. The cotton, the raw material for the cotton, of course, came from the slave plantations in the South. Uh, even after the Civil War, uh, the sharecropper system uh, supplied the, much of the cotton uh, that uh, that went into making the mills possible. So it's a very it's a very difficult story. Uh, the mills were also tended by hundreds of thousands of workers, drawn from many many corners of the of the world, uh, and uh, um, in the process of generating enormous wealth uh, for some, uh, and uh, the fate of the other individuals, the other families involved in making the mills possible was, uh, was much more uncertain. The mills also generated enormous pollution, ultimately leaving the river, which had nurtured it, uh, to be described at one point in the ni- late 1970s as one of the most polluted rivers in the United States. It was the, uh, a poster child for the passage of the Clean Water Act. But the mills still sit, and I think still have a story to tell us, um, even though the work and the money has gone elsewhere. Uh, some mills are abandoned. Some burnt. It's a tremendous fire hazard. Some have been repurposed, thankfully, to more productive uh, ends. And some still wait. So this is a part of a series of images that I've done, which I've exhibited in several different um, galleries, that is intended to explore the nature of, of industrialization and de- deindustrialization of boom uh, and uh, as of bust. And uh, what I hope raises the question of whether or not there was another way. A few years ago, I was traveling on business in Utah. I took the opportunity one late afternoon to investigate the area and search for compositions. It was late spring and the valleys were warm with sunshine, while the mountaintops were hanging on to the remnants of the winter snow. Life was returning and the smell of farms was in the air. Insects were buzzing and the birds were singing. At the intersection of two dusty dirt roads with only a fallow field and distant mountains for company stood the remains of an old stone house. The roof was gone and the walls were crumbling. The chimney stained from countless fires used to warm the small house in harsh winters decades ago darkened the inner wall. These were framed with graffiti and the names of those who left the evidence of their undying love scratched in the inner walls while the outside walls were pockmarked with bullet holes. I have often wondered what story this old house could tell. Was there once a family of homesteaders eking out and existing here through the cold winters in a one-bedroom house? Or was it built for migrant farmhands to live in during the Dust Bowl and Depression era? Where did the bullet holes come from? Was this a hideout for a gang? And were they from a shootout with the FBI? On the return to the Logan Valley, I came down from the northwest along the Logan River. It is a meandering water with several channels and marshland. A two-lane road crosses the water several times in the Logan Valley. As the sun was setting, the moon began to rise over the mountains. I stopped at a small boat launch parking lot 
and found a photogenic group of reeds in the foreground for a subject. The marsh reeds in Mount Logan are illuminated by the setting sun while the moon keeps watch over the land. Hello, my name is Lisa Shea. I am providing the narration for artist Karen Pendleton. Karen is a longtime member of the Blackstone Valley Art Association. She often works in monochrome, creating pen and ink artworks by using a stippling technique. Stippling, also called dot work, is created by using a pen to create tiny dots on a surface. The more densely you place the dots, the darker the area becomes. Here are some details about Karen in her own words. I am a self-taught artist and have participated in many exhibits and solo shows, including Broadmoor in Audubon in Natick and Hawthorne Suites in Franklin, Massachusetts. I have won several awards, both in photography and pen and ink. I have also been accepted into several juried shows, including Marblehead in Southboro, Massachusetts. My love of nature's forms and shapes inspires me to photograph and draw them in pen and ink. The contrast between black and white intrigues me. Occasionally, however, there is a subject that says color me. For these, I will use colored pencil or watercolor. Karen has five works of art in this BVAA monochrome show. The first artwork shows the remnants of the Bernat Mill fire in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. The Bernat Mill was originally built as the Capron Mill in 1920. The very first power looms for wool were used in this mill. Uxbridge had a worldwide reputation for its cashmere wool. It was even featured in a 1953 edition of Time magazine. As the mill industry faded, this location became a vibrant multi-use facility with antique stores, dance classes, artist studios, and more. Sadly, on July 21, 2007, it caught fire and everything was lost. The second artwork shows the General W.F. Draper statue, located in Draper Park in Milford, Massachusetts. This statue was created out of Milford Pink Granite by sculptor Courtney Pollock. It was dedicated in 1912. General Draper served with the Massachusetts 25th Regiment in the Civil War. He served as a U.S. representative for Massachusetts and was president of the Draper Corporation. The third piece shows the Dutcher Street School in Hopedale, Massachusetts. It was built in 1898 as a grammar school. In 1987, the beautiful building was converted into an apartment complex. The fourth piece is of an old Grafton and Upton railroad car in Hopedale. Back in the 1800s, travel through Massachusetts was very difficult due to the woods, the rivers, and the harsh winters. Intrepid businessmen first built the Blackstone Canal linking Worcester and Providence. The canal had barely opened when another group of businessmen leapt in and built a railroad. The railroad greatly vitalized transportation in the region, and it put the canal out of business. The Grafton Center Railroad was part of that second wave. It was opened in 1874 as a connection between Grafton and North Grafton. In 1888, it changed its name to the Grafton and Upton Railroad and extended its routes to Milford and Upton. Passengers used it until 1928. Over time, it fell out of use, and by the early 2000s, the line was nearly unusable. There have been efforts in recent years to revitalize the line. This train car was a historic remnant which fell apart and was eventually destroyed. This final piece shows the Mill House at Stanley Park in Westfield, Massachusetts. This image was part of a duo show Karen did with Laura Senadella, titled One Image, Two Different Strokes. For this particular pairing, Karen's image was created in pen and ink while Laura's was painted. The show was held at Alternatives in Uxbridge in August 2010. Stanley Park was created in 1949 from a gift from Frank Stanley Burveridge of 25 acres. It has since grown to nearly 300 acres. One section contains an example of a functional colonial era village. This mill house is an actual working mill. For more information about Karen, you can view her online gallery at the bvaa.org website.
Hi, my name is Laura Senadella, and I'm a member of the Blackstone Valley Art Association. I'm going to share five of my photographs with you. Number one, the eyes have it. I was looking on my computer for an image of people, and I came across this photograph of myself, and I thought, why not a selfie? This was me in a makeover for a friend's Halloween party. I wanted to find something that had harder edges, something that was more contemporary. I usually consider my audience when I'm choosing photography to enter in a show. I crop this to show more of the eyes. It was difficult. My audience now is the internet. I do a lot of black and white photography, both in film and digital. Number two, the Mystery Bistro. While staying at a hotel in Memphis, Tennessee, I was going outside at all hours of the night to walk the dog. It was kind of scary. On this one night, I was getting off the elevator. I turned the corner and jumped. It was dark. I couldn't see anything. And then there it was. It was a scene. It was like off of a book cover. I had to get the photograph. The lighting was perfect. It gave it a foggy effect, like a mystery bistro. Number three, the story of COVID-19. The candle and the glass lantern representing hope. The painting in the back has a bicycle resting against a tree. The crystal vase filled with forsythia on top of the double Corona cigar box next to the American cheese. The holy, the spiritual, the genius, the rich, the American. Number four, the neon lobster pot sign. This photograph is in a series that I've been working on for some time. I have many photographs of hyster historical signs, hysterical too, from all over New England. Digital shooting and editing makes it so much easier these days. When I started with my 110 film camera that my parents were going to throw out, or later using my own 35 millimeter. Number five, running on time. This was kind of a funny happy find. On my way to a doctor's appointment in Boston, I was running late. I only had minutes to spare anyway. We arrived in the parking lot and across the courtyard I could see an object. I needed to grab my camera and get a view. I knew I would be late for my doctor's appointment if I had done so, but he would understand because this would be the perfect photograph. It was. The clock was actual. Not all clocks keep actual time. Running on Time, Boston University Medical Campus. If you like what you saw and you're interested in learning more about me, you can check me out on my website and social media. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lisa Shea, and I'm doing the narration for Blackstone Valley Art Association member Linda Nelson. Linda is a wonderful photographer, and here are four images from her photography collection for our monochrome show. These descriptions are all in Linda's own words. First up is Nantasket. This was taken at Nantasket Beach in Hull after a spectacular bright red sunset on one side of the peninsula, followed by a cloud-covered moonrise on the other. I lingered after the crowd had dispersed and used my time to practice my nighttime photography. I liked the effect of the glow the supermoon had on the waves and the ripples of the beach with the seagull preparing for flight. This is stillness. This captured an island in fog. The more distant tones of the distant island were softer than the darker trees and the brush along the shoreline.
Balloon Man. Worcester's own balloon man was Nixford Baldwin. He would be seen selling his wares at unexpected locations, such as median strips of busy intersections or more accessible parking lots near grocery stores. Nixford was an artist, and many of his works were sold at a special show at the Worcester Art Group, or WAG, on Grove Street before it became known as Arts Worcester. I loved his expression, his choice of balloons with their sticks and an old leather arrow quiver, and of course his ever-present cigar. Twilight. This photograph of a swan at sunset was saved by the discovery of slider bars in iPhoto. They worked. The result was a rich black background that looked like city lights sparkling around the swan. Hello, my name is Lisa Shea. I am narrating for artist Lisa Martin. She has five images in our Blackstone Valley Art Association monochrome show. Lisa's statements on these pieces are as follows. Eolia Mansion. We often take family drives to discover new places. Eolia Mansion is on the shores of Long Island Sound in Connecticut. This particular spot at the mansion, just outside the massive stone facade and wrought iron gate, was a delicate wishing well among a debris field. I don't think it would have been half as interesting if the debris field wasn't there. In reality, not everything is perfect, and I like it that way. Harkness Park, Connecticut. I was struck by how the children's gravestones and the happy undulating trees somehow oddly complemented each other, as if the trees were playing for the children. Ocean Beach Boardwalk, Connecticut, Fall. This boardwalk is where the Zoltar fortune teller machine was said to be, from the movie Big. We thought it would be neat to go and see it. Alas, it was not there, nor were any people. Connecticut Farmhouse Somewhere in New London, there is a beautiful farm that has been converted to a school. Late afternoon in the fall shows off beautiful shadows and filtered light. I could curl up with a hot cup of tea and a good book and be perfectly content here. Essex Steam Train. I think we all secretly love trains, especially vintage ones. Essex is true to form with their steam engines and character conductors. When I see trains of any kind, it instantly reminds me of the scenes outside the window of lovely little towns and nice memories of destinations. Hello. My name is Lisa Shea, and I've been a member of the Blackstone Valley Art Association since 2013. I adore the Blackstone Valley Art Association. We just do so many kinds of fun projects and expose each other to all sorts of new and interesting types of artwork. This first piece of art that I created is called a cyanotype, and I learned all about this from the Blackstone Valley Art Association early on. When you make a cyanotype, you mix together 8.1% potassium ferrocyanide and 20% ferric ammonium citrate. When you mix those two chemicals together, you get a paint, which is light reactive. So you paint that paint onto some sort of a surface, let's say watercolor paper, or you can paint t-shirts or pillowcases or anything else that'll take a kind of paint. And then when you put it out into the sun and put an object on it, the object casts a shadow. And wherever that shadow lands, the paint doesn't react. So the surface that you paint it with doesn't react. And wherever the sun does land and touch, it turns the paint a bright blue. And then when you rinse it off, it becomes permanent in the substance. So you can make t-shirts out of this. I've made dresses out of it. In this particular case, it's a sheet of watercolor paper and I laid a metal tavern puzzle on top of it. The kinds of puzzles where you try to get a piece of the puzzle uh, unconnected from the rest of it. So I love that it's abstract and it has these circle and square and other shapes and you aren't quite sure what it is. And I also love the textures of the paper itself, how there's these ripples and lines in it that are formed by the paper interacting with the paint, interacting with the shadows and the lights involved. This next piece is a cyanotype and it was made with bicycle gears. My boyfriend for many years worked at a bicycle shop, so these are leftover bicycle gears from repairs that they did. 
I had fun painting the paper, but not fully to the edges. So you can see the rough edges. I like doing this sort of thing. So the cyanotype liquid didn't fully cover the paper. It left some parts white. And then as I laid down the bicycle gears on it and exposed it to the sun, we get the pattern of the gears, but then we also get the pattern of the painting that I did. So I enjoy doing this immensely where I have the paint itself offering different kinds of edges and shadows, and then the objects that I put on it creating new patterns. I tend to like abstract sorts of patterns, as you can probably tell, but they're still concrete in the sense that you can tell that these are gears and that the gears are connecting or not connecting in different kinds of ways. Now we switch over to my love of film photography. This was taken with a Holga film camera. Holgas are 60 millimeter film size, which is a medium format film. So it's uh, about twice as large as the old 35 millimeter film size. So these are called medium format. In 1982, when people were still using film cameras, China decided they wanted to come out with a film camera. And when they looked between the 35 millimeter and the 60 millimeter, they decided to go with 60 millimeter because they thought it was more popular. So they put out this Holga, which is a very inexpensive, plastic, cheap camera. And then all of a sudden the world went to digital, so then people weren't even buying film cameras anymore. But I love Holgas because they provide all sorts of wild effects. These, the camera is plastic, so you have to tape it up. The lens is plastic, and you never quite know what you're going to get. And also with the medium format, you get these nice big shapes, and they are only 12 on a roll. So you have to really be picky about what you're going to take a picture of. This picture is my boyfriend Bob playing in a band. He was plays with Far From Eden, and that's him and his bass guitar. And I like how the long exposure makes his hand sort of ghostly and gets the sense of his movement, and how you just get him and the guitar and everything else fades to black. This next picture was taken with a Holga film camera in black and white, and it was taken at the Walter Plant Square in Philipsburg, which is the capital of St. Martin. St. Martin is a fascinating island because half of it is Dutch, which is called St. Martin, and the other half of it is French, which is also called St. Martin, just spelled a little differently. I love how there's a timeless feel about this image, even though I took it in modern times, because I was taking it with a very inexpensive film camera, the Holga, I ended up getting all of this film grain on it and the uh, contrast from light and dark and the light flares and everything that the Holga is known for. So again, when you're taking film camera pictures, you have to time your shots because you've only got 12 images on this roll and either you get an image or you don't. So I sat there waiting and waiting and I got right when the bicycle was riding across the end of it. So I like the composition of it with the way the, tra the trees lead you off into the beach and then into the white ocean and how the ocean blends in with the sky and how there's a few little people in there for scale so you get a sense of it. But this could have been taken in the, well, I suppose not too early in the 1800s because there's a bicycle, but sometime in the last century. This image was also taken with my Holga plastic film camera. It shoots 120 medium format film. And this is taken with extremist ultra fine black and white ISO 100 film. I love the effects that the film camera gives with the grain of the sky and with the sharp contrast between the light in the back and the um, slight vignetting it tends to do around the edges. This particular picture was taken at the Christ the Savior Chapel in San Juan, Puerto Rico. It's located at the edge of the cliff. Before the chapel was built, they used to have horse races leading down the street towards this cliff, and the horses were supposed to pull to a stop right before they went over the cliff. Well, one time, one of the racers didn't pull up in time, and he ended up falling over the cliff. And while he was falling, he was praying to God to please save him. So when he did survive the fall, he promptly built this chapel at the edge of the cliff to commemorate the spot where he went over. So I love the uh, bird flying up into the sky and the dark shadow that it makes against the sky and the grain, and the details of the bell in the window, and so on. Hello, my name's Luke McNeil. I am a member of the Blackstone Valley Art Association and the owner of McNeil Media Group, a creative services company in Douglas, Massachusetts. I can be reached at luke at lukemcneil.com or through my website, www.lukemcneil.com. 
this first image here was taken in my the backyard of a house that I used to own. So this was right before we sold the house to move into this new house in Douglas. Uh, I had to have the septic system replaced. And during that project, they parked this giant uh, tractor in the backyard. And I felt like going outside and playing with my camera. So I threw my tripod up in a hole and I used uh, the widest angle lens that I had at the time and I made this image and was able to capture a little bit of the starlight in the background. This was in Uxbridge, Massachusetts, so there's not a whole lot of light pollution around. I had uh, some really clear night skies back there. Um, and that's how this image was born. This image we have here is in the Blackstone Valley. This is uh, Uxbridge, Mass, behind where the Sassy Fox is. I'm not sure the name of this building, but I was just walking around back there trying to find images. I'm not sure who the man in this picture is, but uh, he worked very well for the composition. And I, I like this image. Um, it looks to me like the type of image that would, you know, sit in a museum or win awards or something like that. It looks like a artsy kind of image. So uh, that's why I chose this one. I hope you feel the same way. Here in this image, we have a picture of a decaying house. I think this house was in Menden, maybe, Mass? It's no longer there. It was torn down. But I drove by one day, and I saw this scene, and I had to pull over. So that's exactly what I did. Uh, I took a few shots of this house, and in the front, there's a no trespassing sign. That was kind of hilarious, considering. And uh, also, there's a mailbox just sitting out on the front steps. It wasn't on a, a post or anything. It was just a mailbox. So those elements aren't in this particular picture, but I, I liked this one better because of the tree, actually. I like the way that the tree, uh, I don't know, it just looks kind of creepy. And I also enjoy the shading of the, the, the right side of the building, where it's all kind of mossy and uh, just it looks old and worn. I like the texture. I, also in the shingles of the... I kind of like everything about this picture, honestly. Um, so that's why it was selected. Of all the images here, and honestly, of all the images that I think I've ever taken, this is the one that disturbs me the most. Um, and it's not because of the subject matter. This was, I was walking around the streets of San Francisco. I was out there on business, and I had my camera, and this was probably on one of the weekend days where I was just kind of exploring the city, looking for things to take pictures of. And this man walked in my path. Um, obviously, he's wearing no pants and two different socks, and it's an overall sad image, but that's that's not why it gets me. What bo what bothers me about this picture is it's not that uh, the more the more technical among you may notice how uh, this man's out of focus. I didn't nail my focus. That's not what bothers me. What bothers me is that the focus that I did get this woman in the background here, um, the way that she's looking at me, looking at him. I think is revealing and it, it disturbs me because she's looking at me as though I'm exploiting the situation of this man because I'm clearly taking, uh, taking advantage of the situation. Um, and that may be true. I'm not sure. I, I kind of struggle with it. I wasn't out looking for homeless men to exploit and take sad pictures of. I was just walking around try trying to take pictures of the world. And this is something that happened. But every time I scroll through the pictures in my library and I come across this one. Uh, I, I wonder about that decision. And morally, if that's, if that's correct, if this is even an appropriate image to, to enter into something like this. But the show goes on. Here we have a fun image. This is a nighttime image, obviously. It was taken in the desert in a place called Rhyolite, Nevada. That's right near where they used to um, mine for borax, the cleaning stuff, like that powdery cleaning stuff with the mules. This is where all those mules were, or right around that area. Um, Jen and I had traveled out to the southwest to explore it and take pictures of it, and we came across this area in the daytime, and it was full of uh, these types of falling down buildings, and there were art installations there 
when we showed up, it was probably 4 p.m., and there was a, a man in a little shack there that was playing a Native American flute, and he was selling them to tourists that came by. Um, you may have seen I have a photo of a truck with the Milky Way behind it. It was at the same location. Anyway, we, we stayed out there the entire night and took photos of all the stuff that was there. These buildings we were playing with, um, adding light to. So we were out in the middle of the night. We had our cameras on tripods, and we were taking long exposure photographs, so we were getting um, the sky mostly. But in these buildings, we decided to throw our flashlights. So we just put our flashlight in the building and left it on, and then we took some exposures that that way. So that's that's how the light is on in here. It's just a standard um, standard flashlight. There's also, if you look towards the left of the image, there's a bright, blown out uh, little line. That's a, a car that was driving by. So I caught a little bit of the, the only other person out on the road that day. Um, and we have this plane going through the image, which I like. I think it, uh, it adds some, some, something real to the, to the image. Because otherwise, this might look like a composite. This could be a, a sky replacement type situation. But having that um, imperfection, I think, in the sky makes the image m more real. This place is amazing, and I would definitely travel back there and, and recommend that if you're in Nevada at any point, if you go to Vegas for a conference or, you know, whatever, track this place down because it is well worth the, the time and any expense it might take to get there. Thank you for looking at these images. I appreciate your time. Um, I hope that you are able to get out this year and take some of your own images. And um, I'll see you around the, the creative uh, circle. Hi, I'm Lynn Randolph. I've been a member of the BBAA for about a year. I work mostly in pastels, although I'm trying to get back into using oils. Portraits are my focus and what I enjoy most. The graphite portraits displayed here were drawn in preparation for color works. I find drawing in monochrome helps me understand values and work out some of the problems before adding the complexity of color. Both images are from the chosen TV series and used with permission. As you can see, the subjects are in biblical period dress. Matthew is the biblical tax collector who became a disciple of Jesus. For this portrait, I used toned paper with various graphite pencils and a little white for the highlights. Mary Magdalene's portrait is on white paper. I used various graphite pencils and needed eraser to lift the highlight areas. Drawing is so foundational to art, and I try to draw something every day. Hope you enjoyed all the great works in this show. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Lisa Shea. I am narrating for Mary Foley and presenting her monochrome painting, Green Thumb. Mary's statement on this piece is as follows. This is my first show. As a new member of the Blackstone Valley Art Association, I am thrilled to have joined such a talented group of artists, willing to teach and freely share their knowledge with others. I started painting in acrylics last November, and Green Thumb is my third painting. Not knowing at all how to execute a monochrome painting, I needed to research it. I chose a tertiary color, yellow-green. I only work in five colors, the primaries of red, yellow, and blue, Mars black, and titanium white. I mixed to a yellow green and made a good sized batch of it and kept it in an airtight container while I painted this over the course of two weeks. From there, I added white, black, and gray to achieve the tint, shade, and tone respectively throughout. I used a palette knife mostly along with white bristled brushes to achieve texture, which I absolutely love. It shows the interaction I have with my materials. I did not use a still life model I just drew and painted intuitively, enjoying the process all the while. I loved the challenge the theme brought out in me as a beginner.
Hello, my name is Lisa Shea. I am narrating for photographer Mike McCool. He has five images in our Blackstone Valley Art Association monochrome show. Mike's statements on these pieces are as follows. Bubbler. I found this in a deserted corner of the Northeast Market Center in Hudson. It was glowing in the bright morning sunshine. I post-processed the image to add even more golden glow and lend a slightly surreal edge to it. Cables. When I first came to the U.S. in the 80s, I was fascinated by all the cabling along the streets and highways. In the U.K., most cabling is underground. I was so fascinated that I devoted a part of my website to images of cables and poles. This one is taken on the old Route 146 near Walmart. Cape Cod Seashore My wife and I try to stay on Cape Cod at least once a year. We enjoy wandering on the National Seashore. This image was taken near Truro and was quite heavily enhanced with extra texturing and suppression of the color range. Double Base Blue Mood I was at a gallery opening in Worcester a few years ago that featured a jazz trio. The lighting was dark and I didn't want to disturb them with flash, so I winged it and got a very slow exposure image. It was disappointing. I extracted a small part of the image, the bass player, and used post-processing to do a complete color separation, which helped to hide my mistakes. Red Truck Refracted This is an image of a fire truck taken through an old, heavily distorted piece of glass. Elevator shaft. Um, this is a um, photo that I took in the four-story uh, hospital building. The building was uh, put up in the uh, late 30s. And um, I go to a lot of abandoned places. This one was made with uh, a lot of reinforced poured concrete. So the structure was uh, pretty sound. It's been there for so many decades and uh, still is in pretty good shape. Um, when I'm shooting interiors, the lens on my uh, camera, this was taken with a uh, Canon DSLR, and the lens that is there on interiors most of the time is a 16 to 35. That's about as uh, wide as you can get, the 16 millimeter for a um, full frame Canon uh, DSLR. Um, in this case, you know, down at the bottom of this uh, elevator shaft, uh, the wide angle setting makes the skylight very, very small. Um, so I uh, took it with uh, sort of uh, uh, the other end of the scale and used it at about 35 millimeter setting. Um, you know, I didn't, um, I did not get low down to get this photo. Um, with the camera pointed straight up, um, if you can get away with it, it helps to extend the tripod as high as you can so that you can preview what you're getting without actually getting down on your hands and knees in the muck. Um, so with this shot, after I found the composition I wanted, I uh, took a light and dark exposure so that I'd have uh, both the walls of the shaft and the skylight details. Um, if I needed, for this shot I didn't do this, but if I needed detail in the foreground, I would have taken a third exposure using manual focus so that I'd have uh, be able to reflect nearby detail. Um, I shoot raw so that I can fine-tune the highlights and shadows as I do the photoshopping. I like to shoot at the lowest ISO to keep noise down, so um, almost all of my interior shots use a tripod um, because the exposures get kind of long. Um, you know, uh, why black and white? Uh, I'm looking at the original shot in Photoshop now, and the walls are sort of a putty kind of color, uh, leaning a bit to the green. Uh, the bundle of uh, pipes, the narrow diameter pipes that are in the center, they're a bit rusty, and rust uh, does respond pretty well to slight uh, tweaks and saturation and contrast. But I didn't like the idea of just the rust being colorful in an otherwise uh, monotone kind of shot. So I, um, in Photoshop, I click the black and white button. They sort of have a one button thing that lets you see black and white. 
And that lets me know just in a second whether or not the black and white is a good path to pursue. And in this case, it was confirmed. It looked promising. And um, so then I, uh, I don't leave it there because the, the black and white button sort of... Uh, uh, what I want to do is I, use, I put a couple of um, hue saturation uh, layers over my uh, photo so that I can use the... Uh, slider controls on the hue particularly to um, have a lot of control over the um, uh, lightness and darkness and get that exactly the way I want and the purpose there is to emphasize uh, shape and depth um, so that's what I um, uh, I use those sliders so that I can really sort of dial in exactly what I want to see in the shadows and the highlights um, you know, now looking back at this, as I did my photoshopping, I wondered, uh, where is the, um, elevator? I mean, I was down at the bottom of the shaft and we're looking out the top and there is no elevator. So that's a mystery I did not solve. I didn't, I, um, we can only guess about that. So that, uh, is more or less what I've got to say about the elevator shaft, uh, picture. A picnic table. Um, if you drive to Albany and take the north way, uh, halfway up to Canada, uh, that's where you'll find what's left of Frontier Town. This is a tourist attraction that opened up in the 60s and closed in 1998. So this particular picnic table sat out in the elements for a few decades before I came by to take uh, its picture. If you're a tourist and you're visiting Frontier Town and get hungry, you've got a couple of choices. On the main street in Frontier Town, you can buy something to nibble on at the general store, or you can get burgers and fries at the snack bar. Uh, Frontier Town doesn't want you uh, to eat your own sandwich at their picnic table. Uh, this particular picnic table sat outside the uh, office and maintenance shed uh, behind the scenes for staff use. Um, I took the photo with a stellar plastic uh, camera. This is a Diana clone. Uh, the original Diana cameras were made in Hong Kong, came out in the 60s. Um, camera Wiki on the web tells me that something there's something like 80 versions of the Diana camera, and they're all virtually identical except for the name on the camera. Um, most of them were produced in the 60s and 70s, uh, recently, uh, newer as, as um, uh, plastic cameras have become more popular, uh, they've come out with sort of uh, newer versions of them, but this was one of the original, uh, more primitive ones. Um, they have a plastic lens, a shutter adjustment that doesn't really seem to adjust anything, and a focus ring that lets you uh, focus as close as four feet. Uh, my uh, Diana clone, uh, the Stellar, came from a yard sale. I paid something like $3 for it. Uh, um, crudeness is uh, written all over these cameras, and I like that. The crudeness is on display in the photos, too. The uh, plastic lens takes photos that are sort of flat, lacking in contrast. Um, and even when you're on target with the focus ring, uh, parts of the image are blurry, especially around the edges. You can see that. Um, Part of the appeal for me of using this kind of camera is a surprise. I took the photo of the picnic table with my uh, Canon DSLR 2. Um, and to tell you the truth, in the digital shot, the lushness of the weeds uh, poking through the uh, rotting uh, tabletop, that adds an element of irony to the photo, and I like that. But I favor the black and white shot because removing color and adding the primitive artifacts makes the photo... Uh, completely bleak, which is really, you know, picnic tables are generally a happy thing, and to see one so sad, uh, you know, that has appeal for me. Arrow. Um, they've got this term, um, user-friendly, and my word for pinhole cameras is the opposite, user-antagonistic. Um, Pinhole photography uses a phenomenon of physics or optics where light entering a darkened area through a tiny hole will project an upside-down version of the scene outside of that darkened area. If you put a piece of film inside that darkened area, you get a picture without needing a lens. Now, focus, you can't do it. 
Although, if you want to get into the details, you can optimize pinhole size and distance from the film to sort of maximize sharpness. But my way of looking at it is that um, all parts of the pinhole fo photo are equally fuzzy. And uh, if you want to maximize sharpness, get a real lens. Um, because you don't get detail in pinhole photos, you have to seek subjects that let you see broad shapes with contrast. And that's why when I had this particular camera loaded with film, I sought out this building corner, which you can find on East uh, School Street in uh, Wound Socket. So uh, here's the camera. A lot of people punch their aperture, if they're making a pinhole camera, they punch their aperture in a little piece of flattened out aluminum soda can. And for this camera, considering what I was working with and where I wanted to go, I covered the whole front of the camera with the flattened out can. Um, I wanted a camera with a curved film plane, um, so it'll be flat in the front and where the film sits it would actually go around in a semicircle. So I started out with a wooden, a round wooden box with a lid on it that I bought at Michael's uh, Art Supplies. And I cut that box in half and in front of it I glued a uh, thin piece of plywood to in essence hold the pinhole. The lid uh, doesn't fasten tight, so I need to tape the lid down after I load the film. It takes uh, 120 film, which I cut to length in a dark bag. Uh, this is a one-shot camera. That's what I mean with sort of user antagonistic. You take one picture, and then you have to get the dark bag out and remove your exposed film and put a fresh piece of film in. And by the way, you have to cut your film to size inside the dark bag so you have to do that um, you have to develop a, a technic a, the technique for getting a, a piece of film the right size to fit into the camera properly um, with uh, another element the sort of uh, puzzle about using a pinhole camera as exposure you can see on this one there's a black piece of tape that actually covers the pinhole when you uh, are ready to take your shot after you've aimed the camera, and by the way, there's no uh, uh, viewfinder on this. You sort of just have to aim it at what your subject is and hope you got it in there somehow. Um, you lift up the tape and count the seconds. So um, generally, uh, I take three exposures. I bracket uh, pretty broadly. I'll take one at five seconds, one at 15 seconds, one at 45 seconds. And when I get the film developed, if that doesn't sort of, uh, if, uh, if none of them work, those three exposures will actually give me some direction about which way to head in terms of more exposure or less exposure. And um, here you can see sort of the byproduct of uh, developing your own film. Dust is the enemy for people who develop their own film. And when you have a pinhole camera like this one, where you, there's a lot of chances for the film to pick up dust along the way. So dust is a, um, uh, and specks on your uh, picture are sort of part of what comes with it. Um, the dust specks can be removed uh, in Photoshop, but uh, for this shot I left them in there uh, for two reasons really. One of them is sort of a symbol of what I went through to get the shot. It sort of expresses some of the agony in working with a pinhole camera. And also as a salute to the primitive uh, technology I used. So uh, here we have a shot taken with a homemade uh, pinhole camera. Hello, my name is Lisa Shea. I am narrating for artist Pam Siderowicz. She has two images in our Blackstone Valley Art Association monochrome show. Pam's statements on these pieces are as follows. Winter Pool. I was running errands one winter Saturday and out of the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of a stream breaking through the previous night's snowfall. I turned my car around, found a place to park and wandered closer. With my cell phone, I took the photos, and that evening I worked up this pencil drawing. But something was missing. The next day, I looked out my studio window and saw fresh fox prints in the snow. That's it. 
and it incorporated subtle steps into the work. Nature's Sculpture Sometimes you just have to look around and nature's beauty will pop right up at you. Out my studio window, a ground covering juniper protects my hillside. During the snowstorm that night, the leggy branches were curled by the wind and snow into an inner tube shape. This is pretty much the contrast at that moment. I don't think I manipulated the light. It's nature's beauty and I was lucky to hit it right.